Welcome to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast for farmers and ag professionals by the Iowa Farm Bureau, bringing you the news, experts, and educational insights that matter most. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our June 13th edition of The Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and today's episode features two guests with important insights into ways that agriculture is moving Iowa forward. First, Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Nag joins us to discuss the impact of Iowa's recently signed biofuels bill. Then we'll bring on Ben Gleason. Ben is the new executive director of the Iowa Nutrient Research and Education Council, or INREC for short. He'll be talking about Iowa farmers' conservation progress and INREC's unique work to quantify that progress. Let's get started with Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Nag who recently met with spokesman editor Tom Block to talk about the economic and environmental gains we'll see from the new biofuel standard that Farm Bureau members advocated for during the 2022 legislative session. Mike, Governor Reynolds recently signed the landmark biofuel access bill passed by the Iowa legislature this year. How does that bill increase the availability and usage of higher biofuel blends in Iowa? Well, look, this is a really important step forward for the biofuels industry in the state of Iowa. I really want to commend Governor Reynolds for taking a bold step and and doing so in a way that was really practical. I I said this bill considers the practical realities of of getting higher blends through the distribution system. So really, at its core, what this does is it's going to make – those higher blends, E15 in particular, more available. It, it sets a standard. It it requires fuel marketers in the state of Iowa to offer those higher blends for our consumers. And of course, we all know that there's so many benefits to the industry and to that cleaner burning fuel. But top of the heap right now, of course, is when you look at the price of fuel, when you look at what's happening with inflation in this country, all you have to do is look at a gas station sign and know the difference between something that doesn't have ethanol and something that does and you can see that price difference that is a big deal and of course we were working on this concept before all of that happened but it's only become more important as we've uh, now entered into this inflationary period and over the last couple decades iowa has been a leader in the production of ethanol and biodiesel why is it important for the state to also be a leader in biofuel usage Yeah, you know, I I say this all the time, that if we're going to be the leaders in production, we had better be the leaders in advocating for the industry. I think we need to add on top of that now, we'd better be leaders in using the product as well. And so what we've always known about biofuels and the renewable fuels industry from a policy standpoint is that we've got to be prepared to advocate on all levels in all branches of government, right? So we've got, there's times we've had to go fight from a litigation standpoint. There are things that we still believe that Congress should act on to strengthen renewable fuels and favor domestic energy production in this country. There's things that we've had to do with EPA from a regulatory standpoint. And then, of course, we know that at the state level too, there are policy initiatives that can be pushed in order to enhance the industry. I think that all of that just shows that, hey, we benefit from ethanol and biodiesel production in this state economically. Uh, We are leaders in production, which benefits consumers in other states. And we're going to still be tip of the spear when it comes to advocating for this industry. And now what we've added to that is we really are setting a tone, a pace, if you will, for other states to look at and say, here's an example of how you can drive up the adoption rates of those higher blends and increase the availability of those higher rates to consumers. And so we're, uh, we're once again leading the way, but this time it's on usage. Mike, you crisscross the state every year, uh, go to every county. What impact have you seen biofuel production facilities and usage help farmers in these rural communities? Well, you know, first and foremost, these are wonderful facilities that have an ec- their economic engines in their communities. And so that means jobs. So economic activity, it means jobs for the folks that work there. And of course, well-documented, well-known impact on the price of corn, right? In, in, in the case of ethanol, the support for bases. There are parts of this state that prior to the ethanol industry, 
you never dreamt of having anything close to uh, the Board of Trade in terms of price. You were always below the price. And, and uh, you know, it was always places in other parts of the state, the eastern part of the state that had larger bases, you know. And, and so uh, those are things that we've seen impact uh, communities and parts of the state that have been heavy in corn production, but lighter in usage. And so ethanol industry comes in and we've seen that change. So it supports the price for corn in the state of Iowa, which of course we know benefits our producers. But again, you look at the price of fuel uh, that folks are paying right now in this country and in the state of Iowa, and all you have to do is look at the price of E15 versus other blends of uh, fuel, and you know that there's a consumer benefit as well. And then we all know that this is a cleaner burning fuel as well. So when you stack those up, I think that's five wins that we get to stack up and say, uh, this is good for our economy, it's good for our farmers, it's good for consumers, and it's really good for the environment as well. So that's what I see. And oh, by the way, all of this is domestic. At the beginning of the ethanol industry, Uh, remember that one of the key initiatives, one of the key drivers of this was to have domestic energy production, to free ourselves from reliance on foreign sources of oil. And doesn't that sound interesting today? Where once again, we see a disruption in the energy markets with Russia and the Ukraine, the unfortunate, the tragic situation there, which is causing a disruption. And now we're even talking about how do we go secure more oil supplies from parts of the world that don't like us that much. And those were the things that drove us to domestic energy production to begin with. Uh, I think it's all the more important today. And by the way, if people are going to benefit from, you know, that energy production, wouldn't it be better if those were Americans right here in the heartland who were benefiting? So I think that whole notion of domestic energy production, once again, is maybe top of the list uh, when you look at the benefits of, of biofuels. And you mentioned at the top of the interview that this is a very practical piece of legislation. What measures are in place to help those fueling stations, gas stations, install the infrastructure needed to deliver these higher biofuel blends? Yeah, you know, this has been something the state of Iowa has been working on for several years, and that's we we essentially provide cost share to fuel marketers to install the dispensers, the hoses, the tanks, everything that they need to pump those higher blends. You know, we can have a great industry with a great product, but if it doesn't make it into a gas tank, we haven't completed the supply chain. And so it really is important. Those fuel marketers are essential to making sure we've got a successful industry and that consumers ultimately can have access. And so it's right that the state of Iowa should have an investment in that. So the Renewable Fuel Infrastructure Program provides that cost share to stations that are going to uh, install the pumps that can handle higher blends of ethanol and biodiesel. You know, it's cost share. They're making significant investments. State of Iowa is coming in with a share of that. But we also should recognize the huge investment that fuel marketers like Casey's and Come and Go uh, have made in the state and co-ops and mom and pop shops all across the state similarly have made investments like that. And the state of Iowa now has put in over $50 million in in cost share over the last dozen years. Now, as part of the legislation this year, uh, that RFIP, that Renewable Fuel Infrastructure Program, uh, will go from uh, what it is currently at $5 million, it's going to go to $10 million, which again will allow us to even work with even more stations to go ahead and upgrade their facilities. Or when uh, folks are building new stations, they'll be able to go ahead and install right from the get-go infrastructure that's compatible with these higher blends. And one of the fun things you get to do is the Secretary's Renewable Energy Marketing Awards. Talk about those awards a little bit and the interest you've seen from those uh, marketers in installing ethanol and biodiesel blend pumps. Well, we should always say thank you. You know, we should give credit where credit's due. I, I like to make the point, and I think it's so right, that my predecessor started the Fuel Marketer Award, one for ethanol, one for biodiesel. We've gladly carried that on in partnership with Fuel Iowa and Renewable Fuels Association and the Iowa Biodiesel Board and, and our office. And it's important to recognize those folks that were leaders and have been advocates for higher blends of of ethanol and biodiesel in the industry. Gives us a chance to celebrate the fact that I've said many times that you can have a great industry, but if it doesn't make it into the gas tank of a consumer, then we have not completed that supply chain. And so those fuel marketers are a critically important component of that. And another piece of the legislation of protection, if you will, was that it does include some provisions for those rural stations, those smaller stations that only have maybe one pump to have an exemption. How does this help to make sure that any rural stations aren't negatively impacted by this? And this is the part where I say the governor, right from the start, had proposed a very 
practical, a very reasonable bill, because we, we all know that there are stations out there that have some age on them, and they don't have the, the, the infrastructure that they've got, the tanks, the, the hoses, the pumps, that they're not compatible. And from an environmental standpoint, from a warranty standpoint, from an insurance standpoint, it, it, this is a real issue for those fuel marketers. And so the, the bill from the beginning, even as it kind of worked through the, the process in the legislature, had always had as a component of that, that there would be a process where waivers could be granted to stations that had older equipment or that the cost of upgrading was too significant, didn't, didn't make sense from an economic standpoint. So, you know, of the roughly 3,500 stations in the state of Iowa, an estimate might be that a third of those may qualify for a, a waiver because they either don't sell enough fuel for it to be economically viable to upgrade or their infrastructure is too old. And so we will, at the Department of Ag, uh, operate a, a waiver process or waiver system to uh, take those things into account. But again, that one third of those stations that may qualify for a waiver, they're only pumping maybe six, seven percent of the total fuel that is sold in the state of Iowa. So again, uh, when we're looking at trying to get more ethanol and more biodiesel through the system, we need to continue to focus on those large fueling stations that have lots of pumps and they pump a lot of gallons. Those are the real focus uh, for, for this piece of legislation. And as you mentioned, right now in this inflationary environment, I know when I drive by a gas station, I look for that unleaded 88 because it's, it's always, it used to be a nickel and then it was a dime and now I think it's 15 cents cheaper. And, you know, I always look for that when I'm traveling the state. You can see as much as a 50 cent spread between that that unleaded 88 and, and something that's got a 10 percent ethanol blend. And of course, it varies across the state depending on that. And, you know, we have a job to do as well. You talk about those those pumps. We also look at the uh, weights and measures component of that, that we ensure that when you pump a gallon of gas or 20 gallons of gas, that you're getting what you pay for. I unfortunately can't do anything about the price that you're seeing always at the pump, but I can make sure that you're getting what you pay for in terms of the volumes. And of course, we also have a fuel quality program as well and responsibility where we work together with our fuel lab at Iowa Central Community College. They do a great job. They run our samples. And this is also part of us giving customers confidence that they've got quality fuel, whether it's, again, that biodiesel or uh, those ethanol blends, that they can be sure that there's a quality component as well. And to wrap up, we hear a lot of talk about electric and some other technologies that are coming, but why are biofuels so important in Iowa and around the country, you know, given the energy and the environmental realities that we're facing today? You know, it's so important, I think, that as we look at the energy portfolio of this country, that we should be broad in our thinking, that we should be wary of putting too many eggs in one basket. And it is concerning to me that we've got a, an administration in Washington that is seemingly very focused on electric vehicles. And there there can be a, a place for an EV in this marketplace. But if we go all in on that, then where do we become dependent for batteries? Once again, we're talking about you know foreign sources of batteries for EVs. Have we done anything then to solve this domestic energy uh, you know need that we have I don't think so and so what I what I would propose again is that we need to have a, an all of the above approach when it comes to energy renewables can be a huge piece of that but let us not forget domestic because uh, one if we've also learned something the last couple of years about supply chains and disruption to supply chains doesn't it make sense for more of the things that we rely on to be produced right here in the United States and you can't get more local you can't get more domestic than ethanol and biodiesel, and it's also renewable. And so as we look at the sustainability aspect of this, as we look at trying to lower the carbon intensity of, of our economy, uh, then also doesn't it make sense for us to continue to invest in ethanol and biodiesel and the next generation renewable fuels as well. So it is something that's here. It was homegrown. It has been built by Americans, by folks in the heartland. Uh, let's make sure that we maximize that. And even there are opportunities to grow that. But because of all those things, because of the economic impact, the benefit to our commodity markets, jobs that they create, the benefit to consumers, the benefits to the environment, and of course, the fact that they're domestic, that is exactly why we should continue to invest and why it makes sense uh, that we had such an important piece of landmark legislation passed this year. Better for your wallet? 
better for the environment, and better for Iowa's overall economy. And now, thanks to the newly passed legislation that Secretary Nag mentioned, homegrown biofuels will be even more readily available at pumps around the state. In addition to Governor Kim Reynolds and Iowa's state lawmakers, we'd like to thank the Farm Bureau members who spoke out and showed everyone the power of United Grassroots Advocacy, which helped that biofuels bill pass in 2022. Clearly, the crops harvested from our fields create tremendous benefits for our entire state. And the way that farmers grow those crops, using conservation practices and precision ag technology, produces positive outcomes for Iowans as well. For more on that, we bring in Ben Gleason, who was recently named the executive director of the Iowa Nutrient Research and Education Council after a decade working on environmental efforts for Iowa corn. Spokesman reporter Bob Bion takes it from here. Tell us a bit about your background in ag and conservation and how that led you to this role. I grew up in Charles City, Iowa, northeast Iowa, on the right on the Cedar River. Goes through the middle of town, so very aware of water quality and water quantity issues as a river town and and also grew up hunting and fishing on the family farm so very aware of ag's role in natural resources conservation got a degree at iowa state university in ecology when did you come on board and what have been some of the initial items you've tried to focus on in your new role I started in the middle of April, and we were just wrapping up our progress measures survey of ag retailers for conservation practice adoption. So trying to keep that moving and process the data and get things over to Iowa State University while they'll do the statistical analysis. And then the other big project uh, we're trying to keep moving is the nitrogen initiative with Iowa State University. So uh, helping them do nitrogen rate trials on farm fields across the state so we have better uh, science and, and information for how much farmers can be applying because we know it, a static rate is not really appropriate in this day of, of precision technology. For those who are less familiar with the organization, remind us what the Iowa Nutrient Research and Education Council does. Really, it just is, helps the state implement our Iowa nutrient reduction strategy. Uh, that's the long and the short of it. But we really focus on progress measures so we know that we're making progress. We focus on more technology, enabling new products and services and practices so we have more options, and then working with ag retailers, crop advisors, and farmers together because we know it's a systems approach to both the agronomic side and on the conservation side. There are many efforts around conservation and water quality in the state. Tell us what makes you different. A couple things. Really, we're really focused on those three core missions, uh, especially progress measures, uh, just because, you know, we know that's important to justify, you know, our state and federal funds that come to the state. But also, like I said, the whole system approach from the farmer to their advisors to the ag retailers that are selling the fertilizer products. So that making sure that everyone involved in that chain of decision making uh, is informed and has resources to do better in in our nutrient management. Talk a bit about some of the research and work that's been done to date, some of the most impressive INREC findings that point to farmers conservation and water quality progress. So I've mentioned our ag retailer survey. Uh, We're the only state in the nation that does it this way. We're currently uh, looking at other states to to replicate our survey and really it accounts for all conservation practices not just cost shared practices because we know that a lot of things get done without cost share and and we're not going to use cost share to reach our goals we have to have you know those privately invested things that farmers do on their own so that survey really accounts for that and then a few years ago we also did a project with Uh, the DNR and Iowa State University looking at aerial imagery to identify structural practices that show up from the air like ponds and terraces and water and sediment control basins and really took a complete inventory of the state 
using a couple different time frames of years and then comparing those years we can show tremendous progress and also you know the investment that landowners and farmers made to to build those ponds and terraces is pretty impressive so those are kind of our two most unique and novel things that we're doing and really helps us uh, with our mission to uh, measure progress. Can you talk a little bit about how environmental progress is being measured, such as the progress measurement system that utilizes ag retailer sales data and farm records to track and demonstrate that progress made by Iowa farmers? Yeah, so we work with Iowa State University and the, the statistics lab there to design a robust and statistically significant survey. So we randomly select 150 ag retail locations that are providing fertilizer. And then of those 150 locations, we ask for 10 farmers and randomly select one of their fields. So we have about 1,500 samples, not all of those are completed or done. So this past year were over 1,100 uh, samples. And then we look at the retailer records. So they know how the fertilizer is managed. They may know a little bit about uh, manure, but they also know about cover crops and tillage, and, you know, all those things that go uh, into the infield management of the crop that the retailer provides services for. So then we can take those and send that data to Iowa State they'll do uh, extrapolate it for statewide. And then they can also, because of the state's science assessment, look at that practice adoption and model a overall load reduction. So pounds of nitrogen, pounds of phosphorus that those practices would reduce based on the science. So what about your education efforts through outreach initiatives and training opportunities? How can farmers access those offerings? One of the initiatives that we've been involved with is 4R Plus. So they uh, have a lot of blogs and farmer reports. They also have webinars, especially for crop advisors who need continuing education credits. Uh, so all that's on their website. We work a lot with our members. So the Iowa Nutrient Research and Education Council has sustaining members like Iowa Farm Bureau, Iowa corn growers, Iowa pork producers, uh, the Agribusiness Association of Iowa, and several other board members. So we use you know, our members and their outreach and communications to help reach farmers and retailers as well. There's also the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy that's used to assess and reduce nutrients in surface water. Can you elaborate a little on those efforts? Yeah, so the, the Nutrient Reduction Strategy is almost 10 years old and it's principally uh, administered by the Iowa DNR as because they um, regulate the wastewater treatment plants that are a source of nutrients also the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship who you know has had cost share programs for soil conservation for decades and now sort of turning some of those efforts more towards water quality and then also Iowa State University which is providing the science backing for all of these efforts to make sure that the practices uh, perform in reducing nutrient loss and also measuring a wide variety of progress measurements so we can know where we're going in the right path. What's next for INREC? New research on the horizon that you're excited to get started on or new findings that you're getting ready to release soon? Yeah, we've just finished our fifth year of the survey and so we're really excited uh, once that gets all processed and extrapolated to be able to look back at, at what has been accomplished in five years and, and maybe there's a practice that needs you know a little more attention or support uh, or maybe there's a, a practices that are are going gangbusters and we want to keep that moving so that's pretty exciting to have that and really the way weather and, and economic factors can affect practice adoption, you know, it's hard to look at one year and, and say anything about practice adoption. So to get to the point where we have five years of data and can start hopefully seeing some trend lines, hopefully that, that'll help us uh, in our efforts moving forward. And then the new thing is the nitrogen initiative 
We're in the second year of piloting those nitrogen rate trials on farm fields. The governor appropriated from the legislative budget a million dollars. So that program is really going to scale up in the next year and really give us that science that we need. And as we know, agriculture is moving more towards precision technology. We can use that to help us uh, manage our nutrients better and prevent nutrient loss and improve water quality. Results matter. And thanks to NREC and their partnership with Iowa State University, Iowans are seeing a more complete picture of the conservation progress that's being made from north to south and east to west. The hard work that's happening on our farms matters, and it's being counted. That's all for this episode of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. We'd like to thank you and our esteemed guests, Secretary Mike Nag and Ben Gleason, and invite you to tune in to our next episode on June 27th. Thank you for doing the work that inspires everything we do here at the Iowa Farm Bureau, and thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.